All right, y'all. So it's been a little minute. I didn't post last week, but I am back with another video. You in the past, I'm in the future. You, you, you mad, they don't salute you. I need a bag. Thank you so much for clicking on this video. If you're new here, my name is Keila Trishan and I make videos on lifestyle, insurance, and mental health. I also do vlogs, day in the life in the insurance industry, day in the life with a toddler, all the things. So if that's something that interests you, go on ahead and click that subscribe button below. Be sure to turn on your notifications so you don't miss anything from me. And if you're returning, thank you so much for coming back and thank you for your support. Okay, so I wanna get back to the basics. I get a lot of questions on my channel under my videos just kind of about like what type of responsibilities I have as an adjuster. What exactly does it mean to be an adjuster? Is it similar to a call center type position? All kinds of stuff. People asking about flexibility, being able to work from home, working with kids, like everything. So I wanted to kind of just talk about what does an adjuster do like in the most basic form, talk about some of the nuances, some of the good and bad and all that, you know, in between. So if you're interested, if you are thinking about becoming an adjuster, if you're a consumer and you are curious about what adjusters do, definitely go on ahead and stay tuned. Okay, so jumping right in, an adjuster is basically a representative of the insurance company. So when someone files a claim, they are typically gonna be assigned someone that's gonna assist them with determining if coverage applies, determining if coverage does not apply. Um, if coverage does apply, they're going to investigate their documents, investigate, you know, their, their, uh, their claims information, send out vendors to, do, to help them with that investigation, things like that. Provide them with the different perks that their policy may offer because a lot of people don't know until they actually end up having a claim. And if it is a denial, then they're going to be the ones to kind of provide you the information on why your claim is denied, uh, pointing you in the direction of your um of your policy where it states, hey, this type of damage, you know, isn't covered, that kind of thing. Everyone is required to have insurance in some way, shape or form. So obviously we've got auto insurance, you have homeowner insurance, you have medical insurance, all kinds of insurances. So all of these types of uh, industries are going to have industries. All of these types of insurance are going to have someone assigned to help people if claims arise. Uh, so I would say that the biggest thing is you are like your customer's advocate you're going to have customers that are nicer than others you're going to have uh, customers that give you a hard time the biggest thing as an adjuster is you're saying okay you know no matter what this person you know does no matter how this person acts within reason it is my job to make sure that they are afforded all of the benefits of their policy and if there's something that they are not afforded it's my job to explain to them and be able to point to the policy to say why or, or why not something is not covered Now, in a perfect world, you would have one adjuster per customer <laughs> or, uh, you know, a li very limited amount of customers per adjuster. But in the real world, each adjuster could be working anywhere from like, I would say like 10 claims, like for a newer adjuster, somebody who's just kind of getting seasoned all the way up to like in the 50s and 60s, sometimes more depending on what industry, um, or not industry, which type of insurance you do. Like I will say that like with auto claims, because they're a little more like turn and burn, typically you're gonna have a bigger amount of claims that you handle than like myself who handles homeowner claims. I'm gonna have a lower like pending amount of claims. And that's only because the claims are a little more complex like on average so they're going to give you less like claims volume to be able to properly address those claims so i say all that to say that um organization is like a big thing if you're an adjuster and it's where a lot of people struggle because you're dealing with like okay let's just take what i do i do homeowners claims and so if i have like a pending of 20 claims that means that i'm dealing with 20 different homes 20 different issues 20 different situations 20 different people you know so it could get to be a lot and you have to be able to understand like how to prioritize you know what needs to be done right away versus what can wait a few days but you still want to like keep like a tight diary on everything so you don't want to let anything slip through the cracks 
but at the same time you need to know what you need to do first what you need to do second third whatever if you watch my videos where i talk about just like day in the life and stuff i give tips on what i do as far as like putting out fires and organizing my desk in a way that does not drive me crazy very big on like there's going to be people that are a little bit needier than others so those people that are needier i tend to put them above and i don't want to say like above as in they're more important it just means that i know okay like if i'm going to work on this claim later on today the person that is needy and that's gonna like blow me up i'm probably gonna call them first thing in the morning just so i can keep them at bay so i can work on the other claims for people that are just kind of going with the flow and letting me do my thing so being organized is going to be a big thing and then also learning how to deal with overwhelm is going to be huge too with the insurance industry there's like ebbs and flows so there are going to be times where it's like super busy which in my experience is usually like the beginning of the year so after the holidays everybody's back in town now all of a sudden everybody wants to deal with their claim and then the slower times of the year are a lot of times around the holidays when people are on vacation you know people just aren't in the office so things are just a little bit slower but they pick right back up and then obviously you have situations over the summer and different seasons um you know weather events things like that that could be like busier than others so a lot of it is just kind of figuring out how to set up your day and how to set up your desk and also being comfortable and knowing that just because you have a routine that worked this day doesn't mean it's going to work tomorrow. Sometimes you have to tweak it depending on what's going on because although you do have control over you know your desk you do have control over your workload to a certain extent if you're doing it correctly you can't control if something happens with a customer like something that is like, like something they perceive an emergency so now they're blowing you up and you have to kind of pivot and help them through x y and z something could be going on with their housing something could be going on with the vendor that you sent out that messed up something in their home like so you have to be comfortable with pivoting but at the same time having a routine like really helps so i know that was like kind of a lot to digest but you have to be organized you have to be comfortable with pivoting and you have to be okay with overwhelm here and there because the job can be extremely overwhelming so another thing that i find unique about being an adjuster and just working in the insurance industry is people have this idea that you can just kind of do what you want you can pay what you want you can uh, make exceptions for things and stuff like that and it's kind of twofold because you can in certain instances there are some things that are like gray areas so you can kind of work like on behalf of your customer whatever decision you make is going to be for their benefit but there are some things that are black and white one thing that kind of can trip up new adjusters especially is when you're dealing with like estimates so not every adjuster writes estimates it's typically going to be like your field adjuster somebody that has a little more technical skill i am a field adjuster so i actually write estimates but that i have like desk adjuster counterparts that don't write estimates but they interpret the policy so everybody's position um is a little different now for me specifically writing estimates i write an estimate based on what i see what i know is owed this is how it's supposed to go so understanding that your adjuster is not a contractor so i know enough i can talk the talk i understand what's going on but i'm also not a contractor so there might be something where you know because this wall is shaped a certain way there needs to be additional labor in order for the drywall to be put on properly let's just for an example i'm not going to necessarily know that i'm going to write for what i know <laughs> needs to be paid but then a contractor may come in and look at the estimate and be like oh no we need additional for x y and z as an adjuster you are able to pivot in that way so you are able to take expert opinions and you can definitely enhance your estimate because you want to make sure that the person has enough to get their home fixed where things get a little tricky and murky is that some contractors charge crazy prices this is going to be you know with auto with home any type of insurance you're going to you're going to have your contractors that work um and just kind of do exactly what needs to be done to put everything back and they charge industry standard prices and then you're going to have contractors that try to slip in additional things that could be considered upgrades and also their prices are going to be kind of crazy so one thing as an adjuster you have to be able to have these conversations with your insurers with finesse because a lot of times people think that the insurance company is trying to lowball them now i will say having worked for several insurance companies i have seen some of my colleagues try to do the most like they'll act as if it's their checkbook and you know they try to nickel and dime me the way i operate is it's not my job and they'll tell you this insurance companies will tell you this it's not the adjuster's job to try to save 
the insurance company money if it's owed it's owed if if we owe you a hundred dollars we're gonna pay you a hundred dollars if we owe you a hundred thousand dollars to get the job done we're gonna pay you a hundred thousand dollars the issue comes in when you're just paying things all willy-nilly that aren't owed so you have to be very careful to not um overstep that line so it's one of those things where to the customer, it could look as if, you know, you're just being an a-hole, not paying their customers $50,000 estimate. But if we have contractors that say they could do the work for 30,000, putting you back where you were before the loss, which is what we owe, why are we gonna pay an additional $20,000? Because your contractor decides he wants to charge some kind of crazy fee, right? So it's having those conversations and letting customers know, hey, I can meet you in the middle. I understand that like, you don't have to use our contractor. You don't have to use, you know, the people that we recommend. We actually cannot force anyone to do it. But at the same time, we are not required to pay your contractors crazy prices. I always tell people to kind of look at it, take the insurance company out of it, think about what you would pay. If you have a vendor that's saying that he can charge 30,000 to do the exact same work as somebody charging 50,000, wouldn't you go with the $30,000 person to save some money and, you know, be cost effective? It's the exact same concept. So um, as an insurance company, we work with these these vendors all the time. So we can usually spot when somebody is asking for things that just don't make sense. Um, and we try to explain that to our customers. So that's a lot of that. And I would say, you know, in some instances, like the vendors will try to make you feel as if you're not paying the proper amount. But you got you got to take it with a grain of salt. There's some vendors that are um, honest, <laughs> and there are some that are not. So. As an adjuster, it's very important that you're knowledgeable on just kind of your industry. And it's very important that you're knowledgeable on like vendor pricing in your area. So it's easy to spot if you are getting gouged or somebody's trying to gouge you. Also, it's important for you to ask questions. I've said this in previous videos. Once you start asking the contractors questions and asking them to clarify like what they're paying for or what they're charging for, should I say, then a lot of times they'll kind of see, okay, you know, she knows she knows what she's talking about or he knows what he's talking about. So I can't, you know, pull the wool over their eyes like I would be able to do with some other adjuster. So it's a lot of, um, I guess, technical work in a way. Like, and then in order for you to, to not get taken advantage of, you need to be knowledgeable. <laughs> that takes time though. So my new adjusters don't fret. It takes time. There are gonna be times where you're gonna get taken advantage of by a contractor and it just happens. <laughs> but as you get more seasoned in your role, those things start to happen less and less. All right, so I talked about some of the negatives, I guess you could say, of being an adjuster, but I do wanna talk about some of the positives. So one thing that I've been able to attain working in this industry, specifically with homeowners and being a field adjuster, I've mentioned to you guys before, I have a company car. So that's been, I know that's like a tangible thing and it's not everything, but it does help a lot. So I'm in a position where I don't have to necessarily go and buy a vehicle if I don't want to. I have access to the company car, which I can use for personal use and, or I can use, or mostly for business use, but I can use for personal use as well. I don't have to pay a car note on that vehicle. I don't have to pay for the gas, company pays for that. So that for me is like a perk because it helps me in my personal life too. Um, also, it's an SUV, and so I'm able to put my child's car seat in there comfortably, go do my grocery shopping, things like that. Now, I don't go crazy, you know, if I need to go out of town for something, I'm not going to take my work car. Some companies will allow you to take your work car out of state. Um, other companies will not, but I kind of just steer on the side of caution with that. Like if I want to go somewhere further than, you know, my normal errands and stuff like that, I'll just rent a car. It's not that serious or, or fly, you know? So you got that, the working remote, I get asked about that a lot. Just like, um, is it possible to work remote? Is it easy to work remote? One thing I will say is that in this industry, especially like after the pandemic, a lot of jobs went to work from home and this is absolutely a job where you can be just as effective at home as you can be in the office. I think that the biggest thing is your work product is going to speak for itself. So if you don't do that well in the office, you're firing to do that well at home. But if you're on top of your work in the office, you'll likely be on top of your work at home. There's not really much guidance from like management as far as like how to set up your desk. The only time people are gonna really talk to you unless they are like micromanaging you, the only time they're gonna talk to you is if they're getting escalation calls or if they're looking at the, the diaries on your claims and they're overdue, things like that. As long as you're doing your work and as long as you stay up to date and keep those customers from calling your manager because you're not calling back or whatever, then you're usually good to go. 
one thing I will say too is uh, I get asked about like, is it like a call center setup? And it's not. You have a lot of control over like calling your customers. So there are situations where like me personally, and not everybody's gonna agree with this, but this is what works for me. If someone's calling me and I'm in the middle of something, a lot of times I will not take that call. Like if it's something like quick that I can come back to, then I may, or if it's a call that I've been waiting for, um, and you know, I've been playing phone tag with this person, then I will drop what I'm doing to just answer the call. But typically I don't answer the call right in that moment only because job is a lot of like diaries and you want to make sure that things are documented and stuff like that. And it's very easy to get sidetracked with somebody else's issue and then you forget about what you were doing initially. And then a few weeks later, you didn't put that note in or you didn't do X, Y, and Z for a customer. So me personally, I like to complete a task before I call the person back or before I take that call. A lot of companies want you to answer your call every time it rings and all that kind of stuff. And there's all these, you know, formulas about like, oh, you know, if you miss a call and have to listen to the voicemail and you call the person back and leave a voicemail, it, it takes more time. That's all cool and dandy, but I've been doing well and I've been able to keep on top of my desk by making sure that I complete what I'm doing. So that situation is done for the next time I have to touch it. Then I call the customer back and I'm able to give them my undivided attention for their question. So you're going to have days where your call volume is heavier than others, but you're also going to have days where nobody's calling you and you're able to just kind of work your desk. So it just kind of depends really on the volume that your company has at the, at the moment. But it also depends on how good you are at staying on top of your stuff. Make sure that you're calling people back. If you are letting it go to voicemail, don't fall into the trap of not calling people back. Call them back as soon as you're able to, or else that method's not gonna work. Uh, let's see, what else? As far as the other flexibility that I get asked about, so I've worked hourly and salary. I would say there's pros and cons to both. But me personally, I enjoy doing the hourly jobs because I know that if I'm working overtime, if I'm working crazy hours, I'm gonna get compensated for that. The last job that I had did not pay overtime. So it was cool because I didn't have to clock in. Like I could just kind of log in typically the same time every day. But if I needed to log in a little bit later, I had that freedom. If I needed to log out a little bit earlier, had that freedom. But the nature of the job means that you're gonna be working some questionable hours sometimes and if you're salary nobody cares <laughs> nobody cares i feel like with me working or with anyone working hourly it kind of forces you to be a little more efficient because you know you only have so many hours and um if overtime isn't approved for this particular season then you need to get what you need to get done done during the time allotted so yeah i think like just right off the top those are kind of the perks that that i'm thinking about oh very stable Benefits are usually really good. Medical, dental, vision, all that good stuff. 401ks, a lot of insurance companies still have pensions, if that's something that's important to you. So those are things that I would say, like outside of the job itself, I have been able to, you know, create a decent retirement. I've been able to put money away. I've been able to just like, you know, fund my lifestyle and then some with the jobs that I've had insurance. Okay, so the last thing that I wanted to touch on is getting into the industry. I get a lot of questions about, you know, do you have to have a degree? Do you have to have any type of cert certifications? Things like that. And people just asking advice for how to get in. Um, so I did a video about probably like a year and a half ago at this point. I'm, I'm gonna try to find it and link it here. But it was just basically talking about my journey into the insurance industry. So just a little bit of background. I was uh, working in automotive, like I was doing like rental cars and selling cars prior to coming into the insurance industry, which is how I got introduced to the insurance industry. I did have a degree, but I didn't have any certifications as an adjuster. I just recently, um, in the last year and a half, got licensed. And that's because in California, you're not required to be licensed. It definitely helps, but it's not a requirement um, because we don't require licensing in the state. A lot of times you can work off of the California license that your insurance company has. Now, in order to work on different states, I do know um, one of the companies I work for, I was able to work on other states with just you know the the um, company license, but there was another company that I worked for where I couldn't even touch like a Texas claim or a Florida claim or anything like that without being licensed. So yeah, that's something where I don't think that you have to come into the industry like paying for all these licenses and stuff like that. If your company requires it, cool. A lot of times they're going to pay for it and help you through it and provide you with the materials. So when people ask me like, should I get licensed? Should I do all this prior to coming in? I don't think so because let's be real 
you might come into the industry and decide, I don't like this. <laughs> I don't want to do this. And then now you just pay for all this licensing and you pay for all this training and you're not going to even use it. So I say come in if you if you're interested, come into the um, into the industry entry level as a desk adjuster and, you know, do the job and go through the licensing process. If your company requires that, let them pay for it. Um, I'm all about saving coins. So, you know, my company, when I got licensed, they did pay for it. I'm not with that company anymore, but I still have that license. It's just my responsibility now to keep it up. So it's um, like every two years you have to renew your license in the state that, that you're licensed in so that's pretty much what i gotta do i think i'm i'm due to renew my license like at the end of this year but it's like certain like credits that you have to acquire like almost like college course credits that you have to kind of like acquire in order to keep it so yeah don't be paying for stuff that you don't have to pay for like i don't i don't think it's like a bad idea to watch videos like this so you can kind of see you know what you're up against i don't think it's a bad idea to you know look at reading materials online but I just would not recommend, you know, going out of your way and buying all this course stuff for something that you may or may not even like. Also, uh, regarding the degree, most companies are not going to require a degree. A lot of times it'll say preferred. So I never look at the whole degree thing because I, I have a degree, so it doesn't affect me. But that's a question that I get from a lot of people. So what I'll say is, um, if anything, they would probably value like licensing or some type of certification like the CPCU or AIC, they'll um, more likely want you to have that than a degree. Cause even if they require a degree, it doesn't, there's not like a specific field they want you to have it in. It's just, oh, you got a degree, cool. So yeah, come in entry level, get your experience and then go from there. See if you like it. If you do like it, there's so many different like areas you can go into. Not everybody wants to deal with customers. You know, sometimes people want to kind of be behind the scenes but typically in order to get into an insurance company and in order to be able to move around, you're gonna have to have some type of like customer service experience or you gotta start out as an entry level adjuster dealing with customers and stuff like that. So you can learn how to do the investigation, learn the nuances of the company, and then you're able to move into other departments. So yeah, the sky is the limit. Um, you can always come in as an adjuster, you can move into another role. You can come in as an adjuster and you can say, F this, I don't like it. <laughs> so many different um, like avenues you can take. All right, you guys, so that is all that I have for you today. I just really wanted to do this video again. I wanted to get back to the basics. I know I do a lot of insurance videos and I talk about kind of like what I do day to day, but I did feel like there was some room to just kind of explain exactly what's expected of me and of adjusters. And I wanted to just kind of, you know, do that video so I could answer some of the questions that I get on a regular basis. So if you enjoyed this video, if it helped, if you learned something, Definitely go on ahead and click that like button. It really helps with the YouTube algorithm. If you made it this far and you haven't subscribed, if you would do me a favor and click that subscribe button below, turn on your notifications so you don't miss anything from me. And with that being said, you guys have an amazing day and I'll see you next time.